Hey everybody, Jochen Haydn here with what should be my last video on the tracker. This thing really ballooned into a lot more than I had intended, but there's a lot going on with this thing as I've mentioned before. So I'm going to do my best to wrap this one up in this video. So I'm going to dive right into our last grouping of data sets. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is ship classes. So what this screen shows you are not only the individual ship classes that are in the game for both sides, but it shows you their upgrade paths as well. Uh, or specifically what each configuration of each upgrade looks like. So you can filter this by nation, uh, the class, or special attributes. So I'm going to leave it on all. We're going to switch it to uh, Japanese Navy. And we'll take a look at an, a sample of ships just so you can see what I'm talking about. So for example, we're now looking at Japanese battleships, right? And obviously, there's only one Congo class, but there are variations of the Congo class, so that's what we're going to look at today. So if you look at the top line, this is our base Congo class, and it currently shows we have four ships in this class right now, all in the same configuration. So what is in on the left are how many ships are in that particular configuration, and what's in the parentheses are what are being built or coming later on. So you can see that, for example, in the Yamato here, as of this point in our game, we don't have them yet. They're being built. So that's why it's in parentheses. Now, if you look at each class line, you'll see it has all the stats for the ship over here. Well, let's click further down. You see the availability date goes up and more equipment's being added. Now it has a Type 21 radar. Let's click another line in there. It's getting more... AA guns, the availability date changes. Click it again, availability date changes again. Now it has another type of radar. So this availability date is when you are able to upgrade the ship into this next configuration. Now that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to do it. You have to take it to a port with the shipyard and upgrade it there. You can't just, it doesn't just happen on its own. And then the last configuration of the Congo class available in October of 1944 has even more AA guns and the same radar set. I'll show you one more example. The Yamato down here, this is the class that you get or the configuration you get from basically January of 1942. And if you compare it to the last one, the last one has a lot more stuff. It's got more weapons and two different types of radar that have been added to it. So that's what this data set shows you are the different classes and their different configurations for each class and you can sort it all kinds of way available is only going to show you what you got right now all shows you available and what's coming in the future and of course you can again look at fuel and cargo efficiency to see how much fuel each type of ship is burning per day if you're interested in that sort of metric okay let's go to ship upgrades so what this shows you are ships that have upgrades coming either now later on or in the next couple months right you can have uh, you could filter by time so if we look at overdue this is showing us ships that we have that are overdue for upgrade as of right now on the map the screen also shows you the size of the shipyard you need to perform the upgrade and it shows you how much damage the ship will incur by starting the upgrade and how many days it takes to to do it all right uh, and then if you go to next month this gives you a forecast of the ships that are coming due for an upgrade within the next month and then the next two months it's even a larger forecast So when you click this compare button down here, it lets you compare a ship's class from its original configuration to the next configuration. So from the original Tenryu, for example, this is the upgrade on February 1942. It lets you put these two side by side and you can see like, for example, this upgrade increases the AA rating of the Tenryu from a 36 to a 72. If we click this one, the 242 to the 443, it shows you 
that the AA rating goes up. And down here, it shows you what you're losing when you upgrade. So we're, we're taking off some stuff here. And in the blue is what's being added during the upgrade. So that's how this compare button works. It lets you compare the different upgrades that your ships can get. And it helps you decide if it's something that you actually want to do. To me, going from the 242 to the 443 is a minimal upgrade. I don't think it's going to add a lot of value to the ship. But putting a ship down for this may not be convenient for me. I need, I might need that ship in action. So I like this comparison tool because it helps me decide if an upgrade is really worth it. All right. And then on conversions, this lets you see what you can convert a ship from and to. For example, if we look at some cruisers, the Mogami has a conversion that changes it into some sort of aircraft carrier cruiser where it like doubles or triples the amount of uh, float planes that it can carry on there. So basically you're really converting it from a, a standard heavy cruiser into some weird um, sub type of cruiser. So that's what this particular conversion chart shows you. And if you go to all, it shows you all the ships that can be converted from something into something else. So, like, for example, a lot of Japanese uh, cargo ships can convert into, like, AKTs, where they can carry more troops. Some of the tankers can be converted into AOs, which are replenishment ships. Some destroyers can be converted from destroyers into APDs, which are armed, armed personnel carrier type ships. So... This screen just lets you see what those conversions are and what you what you can do with them. All right, so that's ship upgrades. Ship repair. Okay, this is a doozy. Um, I don't know if you think so, but I find ship repair to be a very complicated process in this game. I don't fully understand it all the time, and I have to refer to something quite often. Let me show it to you. This is a ship repair guide that was created by Forum user Alfred. Um, this, in my opinion, is the definitive guide to how ship repair is done in this game. I refer to this post uh, regularly, so much so that I have it actually bookmarked. See, I have the ship repair guide bookmarked. This thing is, this is a very all-encompassing guide, and I'll just scroll through so you can see how complicated this process is. So, if you want to know more about ship repair, I'm not the best person to ask, but I will link this forum post in my video description so you can read through this and try to wrap your mind around how complicated this process is. That being said, let me go back to the tracker and try to explain how this screen works. So in the ship view, this lets you see all the ships. You've got where they're located and like what kind of damage they have, and you can sort it. So you can sort by ship class, if they're in a port, in a task force, or both. And then I like to just click on these up here so I can see, because flotation to me is the most important damage that needs to be repaired because that's what's going to cause the ship to sink first. So I usually sort this screen by the flotation, most flotation damage to least. Then I can see how many, however many of my ships have damage and what kind they've got, where they're at. And over here, it shows you their tonnage and their victory points and the minimum size of the shipyard needed to re affect repairs on it. So, for example, we're looking at this patrol boat right here, and it is showing us a flotation damage of 19. So that's the total damage. And in parentheses is your critical damage. That's damage that can't be repaired unless it's in a shipyard or has a specialty type ship that can be repaired repair only that kind of damage. So again, total damage is on the left. Critical damage is in parentheses. And if you look, when you click on the ship, it gives you a little history box here, and it shows you each turn what kind of damage this ship is incurring. So this patrol boat here on turn two had zero damage. On turn three, it had got a lot of damage. It probably got hit during an amphibious landing or something of that effect. So this screen just lets you see all of your ships and what kind of damage you're carrying. Now if you look at this port view, this is a pretty cool screen. 
um, it lets you see what your where all of your repair capacity is at so I usually keep it on all and region all and this this lets you see all of your repair capabilities on the map on every port you own so I usually sort it by repair repair capacity so uh, Hiroshima Kure has a maximum repair capacity of 100,000 tons and this yard plus PRA is basically like um, a summary of the total amount of, of repair capability that the yard has so it takes into consideration the size of the repair base and the size of the port itself plus any additional ships that might be in there like tenders repair ships ARs AGs ADs whatever ships can assist in repairing other ships that's this is like an aggregate of the repair capability of that particular base and I you can see like this one says 1108 but down here we see some that just have a much smaller number let me see if I can find one okay right here so you see the 150 uh, yard plus PRA that encompasses 100 repair type points for the actual repair capacity plus the size of the port here okay 150 and this is also showing me that I don't have any other repair capability at that base like I don't have any ARs ADs ASs anything like that those type of support ships currently at pescadors that can lend to ship repair so that's how this screen works if you'd like to know more about repairing ships feel free to ask me but definitely refer to the forum post because that's going to have the best information for you okay here's a task force screen um, this lets you sort by all the different type of missions that your task forces can have and this shows you other sorting options based on fuel and I like this because you can look at all your task forces and find out like okay this particular like Kido Butai if I wanted to fully dock that task force this tells you what dock level you would need and right here all right off the bat this is telling me that we just cannot dock the Kido Butai anywhere on the map because the maximum dock size in this game is 10 so this is telling me we would need a size 11 so that's saying that the total tonnage of the Kido Butai is larger than any dock in the game can support so you can't dock it which is going to slow down your repairs right and right here is the ETA and days to the home base so this tells me if I was wherever the the task force is currently at this location if I give it a command to head back to its home port um, it would take six days of traveling this shows you its detection level so obviously that's really bad that means everybody and their uncle knows where it's at on the map so it's probably a good idea if you move it from its current location because everybody can see it whereas the the um, IJN tankers task force the replenishment one that's following Kido Butai has zero detection rate right meaning nobody knows where it's at but you over here shows you the total amount of ships in the task force and over here shows you how many tons of fuel per day each task force is burning so obviously this being the carrier task force Kido Butai is burning a ton of fuel every day operating at its current speed which you will see over here mission speed if you change that to cruise or full speed this number is going to go up dramatically okay uh, the history button down here this gives you a turn by turn a layout or a description of where the task force is currently at where it's supposed to be going the mission that it's on its detection level and if you click load if this is like a cargo task force this would show you what load is currently on the task force at any given turn so that's how history works okay this is another cool button air groups so this will show you all the air groups that are currently inside of any given task force so if we click on Kido Butai click air groups you'll notice we have a massive listing of air groups assigned to it because each carrier for example has three different squadrons on it 
we have what six carriers in there and it also shows you all of the float plane units that are assigned to the other ships that can carry those in the task force so this is a pretty cool screen to see all the different aircraft available to you in your task force so that's basically the air groups button here we'll try one more we click on this cruisers click on air groups and we still see a lot of aircraft here but these are just float planes that are assigned to each individual cruiser so that's what the air groups button does that's basically it for the task force tab you can experiment with this on your own but it's pretty cool okay minefields I really like this one because um, this is a good way for you to figure out where you need to put your ACMs right you, these are your your mine tenders and each mine tender you have at a, at a port can tend to 150 mines so this is kind of what minefields look like when you start out okay for example here at Osaka at Kyoto we have almost 500 mines but we only have two ACMs there so every day we're going to be losing mines unless we either add another tender or we let this naturally attrit down to 300 mines and it will over time but for example here at Hiroshima we have 450 mines in, in the port but we have five ACMs we have more ACMs than we have mines to tend so this will kind of allow you to decide where you need to place these ACMs like if you want to maintain this minefield here at Osaka, you're going to want to take some ACMs from Hiroshima and send them over here so they have enough mine tending ships to keep a certain level of mines. And honestly, the minimum amount of mines I think you should be keeping at a port if you want them to be effective is at least 300. Um, I think 300 is the minimum amount you're, you're going to get any kind of effectiveness out of. So use this particular data set to help plan your minefields out and to help distribute your ACMs accordingly so that you don't waste all your mines because over every turn you're going to lose some and I'll give you an example let's click on Tokyo which has 495 mines and no tenders you click on the history button and it will show you the change per turn now between turn two and turn three we lost five mines and it's not always a consistent amount it could be plus or minus a little bit but if we had like 20 turns loaded here you could see the change in the mines also if you have mined layers at a port and you lay mines you'll see a plus here as opposed to a minus if you add mines to a minefield but bottom line use this thing to manage your minefields and distribute your ACMs accordingly so you don't waste mines okay so we're on the Intel tab now and this tab shows you first the SIGINT and I'll be honest with you as a Japanese player your signals intelligence is pretty crappy uh, this doesn't tell you anything right heavy radio traffic detected from Seattle gee thanks I don't know what that means uh, does it means they're sailing ships from there does it mean they're doing what who knows so I wouldn't get too caught up in the SIGINT for the Japanese player it's minimal at best that being said if you're the allied player your signals intelligence is way better way more detailed so this screen will become very useful to you if you're an allied player because they actually have detailed information that tells you how many ships are docked where who's loading on what how many ships were damaged here uh, aircraft transferred there uh, the SIGINT for the ally player is great. For the Japanese player, I barely even look at it. Now you're going over to the Operations tab. This is like your op Operations Report in game. It's just available to you here in the tracker, right? So you can sort it by event type, unit, location, the details, and the turn. So I usually go current turn. It'll show you just the turn that we have loaded. You can go last three. Or all again I just run current turn but it will show you basically the operation support that you had from the previous turn or your current turn and you can sort through this accordingly that's the Intel tab okay now here's the map so remember 
depending on which batch file you launch, you may or may not have this map in your tracker. I run the one with the map, and you know it, it has some options up here. It can do some stuff. Let me show you what I my favorite part of the map. If you're going to use this map, let me show you how it, it can be used pretty effectively. So you scroll around. So let's, for example, let's go look at mainland Japan. One thing that I like about using this map in the tracker is it has this cool option over here where it says display and I go search arcs. So right now this shows me what my search arcs are for all the aircraft that currently have assigned to any of the bases here in Japan. So the circle is the normal search radius of the aircraft assigned to that base and the intensity of the color tells you how many aircraft are capable of doing that search. So here at Hiroshima, we have a lot of aircraft that have kind of a short search radius, but there's a lot of them. So the coverage in this circle is going to be outstanding. Uh, if you go over here to Ominato, we see we have some search planes here, probably some Jakes. That's about 10 hexes, right? Uh, we have we have some probably some Jakes here that have a pretty decent search radius, and it's not quite as intense as over here. But it's like medium shaded, so it there's a medium amount of aircraft there, so they can mediumly cover that search arc. Now, if you go a little further up, you'll see this one here. This is a search arc probably emanating from Tokyo. I suspect this is probably like a Mavis uh, patrol plane. So it has a very long range, but there's not a lot of aircraft assigned to that unit. So the search arc is going to have very minimal coverage if you're doing a 360. So that's how you can use this to look at your scout plane assets all over the place and determine if they are sufficient for your needs or if you're getting the best coverage. So if we head over here to um, Kwajalein, we can see we have pretty decent amount of search coverage here in close and we have an okay amount of search radius Real far out. Again, this is probably a Mavis or maybe a Betty bomber that's on a search mission. But I like to use the map for looking at search arcs to plan where I want to put my aircraft to see where I can get the best coverage and cover all the places that I want to see. And there's other options here. You can look at other things here. But this is primarily what I use this for. Oh, and it also does not only naval search, but ASW. So this shows you your ASW capability as opposed to the naval search because you know ASW has like half the normal range and naval is obviously a lot further out. So that's how the map works on the tracker. If you launch the batch file of the tracker with no map, you're not going to have this. So don't worry about it. But it's here if you want it. Okay, getting near the end here. Victory points. This is a pretty cool... Uh, tab because it shows you the ratio of points between the Japanese player and the Allied player, at least as we're playing Japan. So when you start the war, Allies have all the points and you don't. So right now, the Americans are winning this campaign by a ratio of 5.78 to 1. You'll see this ratio continue to change and then flop over into a Japanese ratio that's more than one to one as they start taking more bases, sinking more ships, doing more damage. That's the ratio. And the, the ratio is important because if you are able to achieve a four to one point ratio as a Japanese player by 1943, you auto win the war. Game's over. So if you're really trying to get a victory in 1943 as Japan, you're going to want to closely monitor this ratio here because you need 4-1 to one by 1943 if you want to win, insta-win, when that occurs. So this is just shows you the ratio of points. And this also shows you the breakdown of the points, right? You got air loss points, um, base points, ships sunk. All that stuff is in here. Okay, you have air losses tab, which shows you all the total losses for any aircraft in the game. And you normally would sort this by 
Well, you don't. You can sort it any way you want. You just want to look at your losses. That's fine. If you want to look at allied losses, that's fine. If you want to see fighter losses, so on and so forth, you can sort it any way you like. And down here is a total where it just summarizes the total amount of losses that both sides are taking, and it breaks it down by op, ground, flak, air, and your total. So this is pretty cool little summary. This is also available in the game, but if you're in track and you want to see it, you can see it here. Ship sunk is pretty explanatory. It's a total listing of all the ships sunk as it's known right now in this turn. And you can sort by Japan or the Allies. And you can also sort by subclass. I usually leave it all in all. This shows you the tonnage and the victory points. And there's a little option here for for scuttled because if a ship is scuttled you don't get all the victory points for it as that other player so if the Japan if the British scuttled the repulse for whatever reason you don't get the full 202 you get half of that so it, that's why it's important to know if a ship was scuttled or if you sank it or it got sunk by the enemy and over here you actually have a place where you can type in notes so if you want to go here to the repulse and go Fog of War, don't know if it's really sunk, right? Now you have a note there, and you can keep an eye on that. And as the turns progress, you can check in a few months, and if this thing just disappears, then you know that it actually didn't sink. But if it's still there after a few months, then you know that it actually did sink. And then there's a chart here. It just does a graphical representation of ships lost and air losses. And the more turns you run, the more fidelity you'll get on this chart. Right now, it's only showing us two turns worth of data. But two, three, four hundred turns, this chart's going to have a pretty cool little uh, spikes and, and troughs and things in it. So it's just a chart to visualize your victory points. Okay, and the last tab is the summary page. So this shows you different types of things that you got in the game here. So naval shows you the total amount of ships and by class and by type how many are active and how many are total so this is what you got as of this turn and this is the total amount that exists for the Japanese player if they elect to build all these things so by the end of the war Japan will have a total of 237 destroyers if you elect to build them all that doesn't mean they're all going to be active at the end of the war but that's how many total you can have and this is how many you have right now this shows sunk ships over here right Japan on the left allies on the right and the class breakdowns and then you can go into more detail here by each type of ship class and how many you got how many are delayed how many are sunk pilots it just shows you a summary of the type of pilots you've got total pilots how many are in the army or navy if you're playing as allies it's going to show you each country's nationality and this is a breakdown of the type of fighter of uh, the type of pilots you got there's different types of pilots, right? You have fighter, fighter bombers, level bombers, recon pilots, total planes, land combat units. So on the left is what you currently have in use. And on the right is the total that you will have by the end of the war. Because a lot of these are going to come in later on as reinforcements, right? Air groups. More G was info. So as of right now, we have 52 air groups that are running fighters. By the end of the war, we will have had a total of 228. A lot of them will come in later as reinforcements. And the last bit of data, the scenario. And this is important because each scenario may have different options depending on how it was designed and how it was intended to be played. So this is the scenario one, War in the Pacific full campaign. So it was edited and created to have the following options. As a Japanese player, I get 50 political points per day. I have player-defined upgrades on. And these are our different uh, modifiers. And these can be changed in the editor, or each scenario could have different uh, multipliers depending on how it was created and for what reason. So, so for each resource center we have, it gives us 20 resource points. Um, and obviously this is pretty intuitive, but like um, a light industry resource in, 
that's what we get out. That's that's what you put in to get one supply. Um, at, in this scenario, a refinery oil in. So for every ten oil points we put in, we get one supply point out, nine fuel points out. So these are just the modifiers for your particular scenario. If you're playing a different scenario than this, it's going to show you different modifiers if that's how it was designed. Okay, so we've gone through all the data sets. The last thing I want to show you before I end this video is this really cool option over here. Export CSV. So let's say we want to, we're one of these spreadsheet nerds and we're really good at using Excel to track stuff and you have different filters and you want to, I don't know what you want to do with it. You can pick a data set, right? And you can, t you can export it to Excel. So let's say, let's pick the, uh, I don't know, the, what, what am I looking at? The Intel report. Yeah, let's go Intel report, right? So we use the filter that we have set up in the Intel panel. So let's, let's go do that real quick. We'll go over to the Intel panel. And we're going to have it set for current turn. Okay. Sigint, current turn, current turn. So now we go up here to export CSV. It's going to use the filters that we currently have a set in the Intel report section. If we click export, it's going to create us a CSV file, which is basically an Excel file of this particular data set so we can look at it in Excel. Let me show you what that looks like. If you go to your actual main tracker directory, you'll see now that you have an Excel document that says Intel. And if you open that up, it shows you what you had in there on that particular data set. So right now this is showing us SIGINT only. So let's take a look at that. That's not really what I wanted to see. Hmm, maybe that wasn't a good example. Let's do something else. Let's do aircraft production, okay? So we'll export that one. That might be a better. I'll have to go get back to you on how to make the actual operations uh, tab print out because SIGINT wasn't really what I wanted. I'm going to try one more thing. Now that I have it clicked on that tab, let's see what that does. We'll overwrite the existing one. Okay, so now we'll rerun this Intel. Nope. Still did say again. All right, I'll have to get back to you on that one. That wasn't a good example. But here's the airframe production. Check this out. This thing exported the entire aircraft production tab of the, um, of the tracker. So now we could go up here, for example, and go to sort and filter, right? Now we can go up here and say, I just want to look at the zero. Now we have all that data on a spreadsheet. And I don't know what you would want to use this for, but if you're really good with spreadsheets and you want to find some way of creating some cool little thingamajig for your needs, you can export any data set from the tracker to Excel. So you can go in here and do whatever you want with it. So I don't know if you need that. The option exists, and that's how you do it. So again, they dump right into the main folder for tracker and that's basically it I don't know if there's anything else I can show you right now um, I'm gonna end this video I want to thank you guys for your patience because this took hours of time more than I thought it would but there's just so much going on here and I know I probably glanced over a lot of important topics so if at any point in any of the videos that I've made you have more questions about a particular data set that I did not fully explain or maybe my answer wasn't good enough please uh, leave a comment and tell me what you want to know so i can get you those answers because i want everybody to understand how this thing works as good as i do 
or better. Anyway, I'm going to end this again. Thanks again for watching. And please stay tuned for more tutorials because I'm going to be doing a lot more of these on all kinds of different topics. And if you want to help me make videos, tell me what you want to know about and I'll do it. All right. Have a good one.